Well, good morning. It's good to be here with you again. It's good to see different faces. Uh, it's good to be able to join and share some of the thoughts as obviously been on your minds over the last few months. But before I do start, I just refer back to uh, the reading we had right at the beginning in Isaiah. It's a most encouraging passage, I think, when we come to worship, we come to give thanks to God and appreciate all those things around us. I'm sure as those traveled down the river yesterday felt something of the appreciation of nature, even if it was raining, um, I'm sure there was water below and water above and water everywhere else. But fortunately, it sounds as if they didn't get wet, but uh, certainly not in the water of the river. But it's good to see and know something of God's creation. And many people have said God wrote the Bible, which we have and we read, and also the book of creation. And I truly do believe that. Um, just to recount to you one experience I had some years ago, I enjoyed walking and was walking up in the Lake District in Helvellyn. And uh, I was up there on my own, which was unusual. Uh, and as I was walking up there, um, it was all cloudy and rather a miserable day. But I thought, no, I could persist and go to the top. I got to the top and uh, wandered around for a short period of time. It wasn't the best of clement weather, so I turned to come back down. And as I turned and walked down a fairly gentle slope from the top, suddenly the clouds cleared. And if ever you've been in that experience, when suddenly the clouds and you see an amazing vista in front of you, it helps you to be brought to your real senses to appreciate what God has made. And uh, that I've had happen not just then, but a number of times when in going for walks, you suddenly realize what God has made. God is good. And he has given us so much and so great a reason, reason to give him praise, thanks and adoration. So let's uh, come to the real subject of what I was asked to talk about today. Um, you've been looking at uh, the book of 2 Timothy, um, Paul and the next generation. Uh, and certainly Timothy comes into that category. And Paul's support team. We might be coming right to the end, but I think there's a great deal to learn from these last few verses. And it teaches us a lot, I do believe, about Paul, his feelings, and his relationship with people. And we'll break it down a little bit more today, and probably even more than this, in looking at the support he received, the need for encouragement, and also the importance of relationships. And sometimes we perhaps don't put them on a high enough and a significant enough pedestal. But okay, let's look at the verses we're considering this morning. I'll read through them uh, from 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting off at verse 9. Here's a plea to start off with. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because of his love, love of the things of life and has gone to Thessalonica. Cressicus has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, be sure you bring my coat left with Carpus in Troas. Also, bring my books, and especially my papers. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. But the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we said. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it be not. May it not be against, counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. Yes, the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Paul's final greetings. Give my message to Priscilla and Aquila and those who live in the household on the Sephorus, Erastus, staying at, with, at Corinth, and I left Troph. Trophimus Trophimus uh, sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubus sends your you greetings, and so does Prudence, Linus, and Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. May the Lord be with your spirit. 
and may his grace be will with all of you. I think this passage expresses quite a bit of how Paul was feeling. He was feeling abandoned. I don't think the text actually does say that. If you actually look at it in detail, the number of people's names he quotes, there is a particular circumstance in the middle there that indicates his abandonment and his feeling alone. But we can see that Paul was facing a difficult time. He'd been at this stage two years and more in Rome. He'd been fortunate enough not to be in close arrest within prison a lot of the time, if not all of the time. He spent his time in house arrest, which meant he had a degree of freedom, as he'd had in their trip to Rome. Uh, he stopped off at a number of places on the way, be it because they had to or be it because it was just where the boats went. But as he travelled, uh, the captain or the, um, the guard who was with him allowed him to mix with the people he knew and his friends. And it gives us an indication, if we read in Acts chapter 28, something of the number of people that Paul had connections with, the friends he had around. He had a good and big support team and people around him, despite how he felt at that particular time. Now, he had a real plea at the beginning of this passage. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. We can see from this book, and I'm sure you Many have said this as they've gone through this book. There was a close relationship between Paul and Timothy. Timothy, almost like a son to Paul, and Paul had great encouragement for him and encouraged him in the work he was doing. Of the books that Paul wrote, there are several that are written directly to people. These two to Timothy, one to Titus and Philemon as well. Others generally to churches. But here he is targeting the needs of a particular person, as we would see if we went back right to the beginning of the uh, book, and we see how he was writing directly to Timothy and the needs of Timothy. He'd also felt the desertion of Demas, and he had deserted him because he loved the things of this world and had gone to Thessalonica. Thessalonica at that time was quite a prosperous town and a place where no doubt riches could be earned but he was a person who had, in Paul's words, deserted him. He'd gone away. He was one of those that had left. And then we see Cresings. He had gone to Galatia and Titus had gone off to Dalmatia. People who he mentions, but he doesn't say there's a reason behind it. He doesn't say he deserted me. They've gone. It's a fact. They put down no more detail in respect to those. But he is very thankful for the person who had always been very faithful to him, Luke. Luke was there. You may look in your life and relate back to people who have always been there for you. Parents. I remember my father was keen Christian, and through him, it's, I, I was brought into the church as a young child. And I look back with thanks that he was there for me. And I noticed after he had died, he wasn't praying for me. And I don't know whether others have noticed that significance, those who've been Christians, and somebody has passed away, and you suddenly notice it's a difference. And it is, it's a, it's a sadness. But here we have somebody who was constant with Paul, and we read of him many times, of Luke being there, and Luke obviously um, uh, wrote many of the books that Paul uh, talked to him about and told him about. Now, the significant person comes next, and that is Mark. You may know from Acts that Mark and Paul fell out. Through a missionary journey, they were going to go on. Uh, Barnabas went off with Mark and Paul went off with uh, Paul, uh, Paul and Silas uh, went off together. But here, I think, is the most encouraging thing. One thing about the Bible is when you read it, it's not an historical account that follows session by session. You have to dig out from different places where these things tell you. But you have to go back into Acts to see how he fell out. But here, we don't read in Acts that they got back together again. But when we come here to Timothy, we find, yes, they're in a good relationship again. And what's his relationship say? He will be helpful to me in my ministry. How contrary to the disagreement they had before. Obviously, things were solved. And I think that's a lesson for us as well. Sometimes we can disagree. But it's good that we can come back together and we can share. Put those disagreements in proportion. So as they become things that aren't significant in our relationships. Unfortunately, this is what Paul was able to do. 
And then he also mentions Tychicus, and I'll I mention a little bit more. Well, I'll mention a little bit more about him now. Um, in looking at him and thinking about Tychicus, he was certainly a person that is mentioned before uh, in the scriptures. And um, in, his, in the mention of uh, Tychicus, uh, he was, in fact, being sent to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a seat of rebellion as far as the Christian well, not rebellion, that's not the right word, I don't think, to use. It was certainly a place where Christian faith was very difficult to stand by because of some of the gods they had there, the many gods they had, particularly Artemis. And there was a lot of uh, opposition that took place in that city. And he must have had a great deal of faith in Tychicus when he sent him back as an um, ambassador to go back to that city to help and to encourage the people. We read of Tychicus in Colossians chapter 4, he is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. He was someone who obviously Paul had a great deal of confidence. I can send him there, knowing he is a minister of my words and sorry, of God's word uh, to those people and will be an encouragement for those people who are left there. So we see people there in that first section of the book, uh, of the uh, passage. First of all, some one who abandoned, others who went on to different places. And also we see here Titus, um, sorry, we see also the fact that they were people who moved on to other places and I'm sure provided help for the individuals in the particular areas. They were fellow servants. When I read that passage from Colossians about Titus, it refers to fellow servants working together, being strong together. And I think it's always good to have others with us who can give us strength and encouragement in what we're doing. It's difficult to work alone. Um, my wife, before we were married, went and spent some time working in Morocco. And there was a lady there who had spent a lot of time working with the Berbers in the Sahara Desert on her own as a doctor. And she was for 10 months of the year, completely separated from other Christians. Very few of the people there became Christians, but nonetheless, she worked as a doctor providing the needs, and some did become Christians. But it's one of the people I know of, and others you may have heard of, um, Charles Marsh, uh, may ring bell with some of you, was a person who really struggled in, well, struggled? No, God blessed him and encouraged me in the work that he did, although he was very often completely on his own, as was this lady as a doctor working in Morocco. But there is that great need for support in doing work. But fortunate, I'm here in a church today where you have a family of people who are together. Here to able to encourage, help one another, show love and understanding of one another, meet needs of people when they arise within the church situation. And that support is needed. Now, often when we look at support in the New Testament, we see it's often referred to as financial report, support. And that is necessary. And you've just had a fundraising session, which will help people who are, it was Coventry City Mission, I think, wasn't it? Um, and help people in that work, in what they are doing within the city. And it's good to see that that financial support is given, but there is much more to support than just that. As I intimated a little earlier on, Prayer support is so important. Be honest in your prayer. Be open to pray. One thing that I learned from my father many years ago was, don't promise to pray for somebody if you're not going to. It's so easy to pass comment, I'll pray for you. It comes off the lips very easily. What is your intent? I don't do it often because I know that I will fail. And I'll make sure that when I do say I'll pray for somebody, I spend time praying for them. And it's important to have that support and that encouragement around us from different people. Paul's support often was needed in different areas. And he, in fact, financially supported himself in many situations. If we read through the book of Acts, he followed the trade that he had, a tent maker, somebody who was important in those days. Um, the tents aren't quite like the ones you can just blow up these days, uh, often made of skins, uh, needing treatment on a regular basis. 
but nonetheless heavy, difficult to carry around, not as portable as today. And considering the difference in transport, it must have been difficult moving these tents around. But nonetheless, it was a trade that Paul had. And we find, in fact, if we read in Acts chapter 28, that Paul, in fact, was supporting himself while he was there in Rome. And it would appear that may well have been using his trade to bring him that uh, support. But there is that need for a network of support, support that encourages and helps other people. You may be part of networks of different people and helping different people in different areas. Uh, and it brings encouragement to be able to do that in many ways. And as I look at the encouragement, uh, as another point that I think is important to recognize from here, because Paul did get encouragement from some of these people that we're talking about. They weren't people that were just cursory friends. They were those that helped and encouraged him in different ways, even though Demas may have left him and gone away. I just read a couple of passages of scripture that really uh, help us to understand the need for encouragement. Romans chapter 5 and chapter 15 and verse 5 says, May the God who gives us endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude and mind towards each other as that of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus encouraged. And I do believe today in the same way he encourages us in our lives each day. When reading his word, when understanding and praying to him, words of encouragement and help and strength often can come in those times of closeness and personal devotion and time with him. Earlier on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it reads, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Those are the instructions to Timothy. This is what you need to do when you're talking and preaching to people. You need, yes, to correct, yes, to rebuke, but also to encourage, to help these people in their situation. But do it, what? With patience and careful instructions. Be careful in what you say. And shall I say, the way you say it? One person can say it in one way, and it doesn't offend. Somebody else might say it, and it comes over very harsh and very different. And I'm sure all of us have experienced that in different ways in our lives, in different situations. It's good to be able to encourage. Several months ago at church, we had a new family come and join us from the Ukraine. It was just a lady and her two daughters at that time, one baby that had been born at 24 weeks, but unfortunately, um, through our medical system, managed to survive and was and is still growing well. But it suddenly brought face to face the situation in Ukraine. At that stage, I had not met anybody else who come from that country. I'd heard about them, I knew of them, and I've been houses where they'd been. But suddenly to be face to face with somebody in that situation, a lady of the age of 31, having completely lost walked away and said as she left, I packed my life into a case. And she left the country and came over here, lived in Bromsgrove and then came to live near the church. Her mother was also with her. Eventually her father came over as well. Through it, we've met three other families and are involved with them as a church. But it brings you face to face with that situation. But we've been brought there, I'm sure, to give them encouragement to give them help, to supply to some of their needs. This is something I believe as Christians is a responsibility we have to a wider population. This lady was from a Christian background. Her parents were Christians. And it was really good when her husband came over just for a couple of weeks, uh, how they stood up at church and brought us words of encouragement and thanks for what had been done for them as a family. And it is a difficult and hard situation these people have to face not wanting to keep on reminding you of perhaps of our own church, but we had about five years ago, a lady come to us from Zimbabwe um, named Tapiwa. Um, she lived in a village in Zimbabwe. We were doing a, a training, uh, a Christian college training course um, in, in Birmingham uh, and came to us as a church. And it was encouraging gradually to have got to know her and support her in setting up a school back in Zimbabwe for some of the children who had to walk normally eight miles a day to get to school. It's a long way. 
I mean, they start very early in the day. But now she's been able to set up a school uh, and the government have accepted it and agreed with it and we continue to support her. People need encouragement. I'm sure you do. I know I do. Uh, and I'm very thankful for it in many situations. We also see here in this passage where there was somebody who opposed Paul. It may well be the Alexander who we read of in Ephesus, who was a Jew. They pushed him forward in Ephesus to be their spokesman as Jews. Uh, if you read it in Acts chapter 19, in pushing him forward, he stood in front of the crowd and they booed him, it sounded like. He didn't get a chance. He couldn't say anything. And as soon as they realized it was a Jew, they took no notice of him because they had strong beliefs in other gods. And so we see there is this opposition. What opposition do you see to our Christian faith in our country today? It isn't quite the same, is it? Certainly not as this was, or that you would see if you went to countries like Iran, Iraq, Yemen, some of the African countries where many people have lost their lives because of being Christians, in China, Indonesia, um, North Korea. You can name many, many countries where there is direct opposition to the Christian faith. I believe the opposition we have here is much more total. The devil is very wise in the way in which he brings opposition. And that subtlety is coming. And I do believe in our country there will be outright opposition in the future. I can see certain things coming in that are going to cause major issues and problems for the Christian church. Unfortunately, in some areas like the LGBT issues, there is division within the church as to how it should be dealt with, which makes life even more difficult. But I do believe the future in that particular area and many others uh, will cause concern and worry and wisdom in respect to how they're dealt with. Now we come to the section where Paul obviously does feel very much abandoned. Um, the first time he was brought before the church, no one was with him. There you can understand him feeling very much alone. And his words are, everyone abandoned me. Have you ever been in that situation where you feel alone? abandoned, in danger, concerned, worried about what the future holds as far as you're concerned. But one thing Paul makes quite clear is, may it not be counted against them. But the encouraging part, and I think this is a great encouragement, and we look at this more in a few moments, is in fact, he recognized the Lord remained with him. Yes, he delivered me, from attacks. Now, it might well be where he refers to it in verse 17, the fact of certain death. It was certain death at the mouths of lions. Now, that's what it refers to in certain chapters. Now, a number of years ago, we were in Rome and went to the Colosseum, which architecturally is an amazing building. And when you read something about the history and how it was created and what they did in some respects in there, it was amazing. But what was it there for? the entertainment of the aristocracy in seeing people killed, often pulled apart by other people, either gladiators or by animals. And it must have been a horrific place and rather a bloodthirsty group of people would sit there to watch. It might sound to us something that is in the past, but it is concerning when we look and consider some of the things that happen but not perhaps right directly as it does in Ukraine when somebody shows hatred towards others. But here we see something is done just in the um, guise of entertainment. And Paul obviously was fearful of that, but he was saved from it. What happened to him in the end, we don't fully know, though much in history is given to suggest how he passed into the kingdom of heaven. But he brought glory and wanted to bring glory even in those situations all glory to God forever and ever are his passing statements, having felt that abandonment. Uh, <clears throat> we have links with an organization, a church called Hands at Work, which works in Africa. And we are very much in contact with a work that's taking place in, I keep on getting the Zs of 
Africa mixed up. I probably have already. Um, I think it's Zimbabwe. Um, and that particular group, there's a fellow called George, uh, and he is responsible for some of the work that's taking place. And he sent a letter recently, heartfelt feelings of feeling abandoned. Now, he's many miles away, four or 5,000 miles away into Africa feeling that people were just not there and caring and loving him. And he expressed his heart's feelings. And I think this has a similarity to what we read here, as far as Paul is concerned. He felt abandoned, and it's good to be able to send back words of encouragement for him. The thing I find so encouraging from this passage is, yes, we talk about people, and people who are there to support and encourage Paul, even though he felt abandoned. But where does he find his real strength? That comes in verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear and he rescued me from certain death. And that I find so encouraging. I'm not trying to discourage or disparage in any way care and comfort that we can give to one another, encouragement for one another. But where does our real strength come from? Where is it anchored? Where is our foundation? Where is our faith? Where is our belief? What difference does that make to our everyday living? What difference does that make to us as people in our thinking and considering of how we live our lives? Does it really make a tremendous amount of difference? Paul's strength in a desperate situation, it's very clear where it came from. It came from God himself, the strength of God that gave encouragement to each one and can give encouragement to each one of us as well. Right at the end, we find that there is a list of companions. And he asks that Timothy should give greetings to these different people, Priscilla and Aquila in the household of Anisiphorus, Erastus, Trophius, Malik. There's a list of all these different people he's asking for greetings. But then he also says at the end, may the Lord be with you in spirit. But he says, can I also um, bring my greetings from these different people um, that were with him, I assume, Prudence, Lydus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters who were there. Can I just go back on what I said right at the beginning? Paul had relationship with a lot of people. And this passage shows it. There's one particular circumstance where he brings out right in the middle. He said, I was alone, but God was with me. And I think that's the encouraging part of what we read here. God was with him, but there were many around that encouraged and strengthened and helped Paul in his situation. Have you friends? Have you people around you that you know you can trust and you can go to at times of need? So important, I think, in our Christian experience to show that love and concern for others, particularly to other people outside. Um, as people come into their church, do they feel and know that love, that concern, that compassion for them as people, as well as people we want to see come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And it's encouraging to see that as people come into many churches, they feel that and they are encouraged by it. In conclusion, really, I'm sure going through to Timothy has brought many lessons. When we leave here today, reflect. Think about the different times, not just on what I've said today, but reflect on some of those lessons you may have learned yourself. Things that may have brought you encouragement, things that may have brought you help, things that brought you challenge. Consider them. The reason for having a church service and people being at a church service is really to help one another, to encourage one another, to lift the other one up, but also to challenge, also to bring you face to face with what God is saying to you. When we look right at the beginning of the book of Timothy and uh, the second verse of the first chapter, Paul writes and says, I am writing to you, my dear son. It's a close relationship. I've got sons. Very pleased to have sons. And there is a strength and a close relationship with them. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Right at the end of the book, he refers to that grace just the same. May you know God's grace. And may we all know God's grace in our friendship, relationship, 
and living together with each other. So what have we learned and what do we learn about relationships? The importance of relating to one another. I think it's so important. Uh, I, for a number of years, worked with British Telecom, encourage people to use the telephone. Personally, I think the telephone is a terrible medium to use. Um, and I'm certainly in the feeling that um, the social media these days is even worse. Um, I think face-to-face -face relationships are so important in our world each day. They say so much to other people. I can look around at you and see you this morning, and it's not just words that I'm speaking to you, but you give me feedback. And when we go and talk people face to face, you get feedback. And it's more than just words that you understand. You understand their feelings. The expression on their face tells you something about where they are and how they are feeling at that particular time. Paul here expresses some of his feelings. How much do we express our feelings when we meet with other people? It's important that we express those feelings to one another, that we support, as I mentioned in the different titles I've used this morning, that we have feelings, we show support, we give encouragement, and where there is opposition, we help and encourage them. Where we see people feel abandoned, or we do, we turn to the right place for our strength, that we may have strength and encouragement from companions around us. Paul, twice in this passage, calls out to Timothy, come to me. Come to me before it comes to winter. I have needs. I want you to be with you. And I'm sure we can say, of friends that we have and people around us, we need each other. But above all, we need our Savior, Jesus Christ, present in our lives to give us strength, encouragement, and understanding of one another. May the Lord bless you and keep you in this situation here in your church. We're going to sing.